Edward, in the upcoming production of You've Got That Thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us. That's all right. <laughs> Tell us about Edward's role in the show. Uh, so Edward is the narrator, really. He's the eyes through which we see uh, the events and the, the history of Cole Porter's life and times. Um, and I guess he's also sort of a culmination of uh, all of Cole's lovers that you know, never really got the press time because it wasn't really something that was, was talked about, but was still very much present in his life at the time. So based on that, what do you think was the appeal of Cole Porter? Oh, I think it was quite, quite a universal one in, in the way that uh, he captured this essence of um, fun and frivolity, not only in the luxurious way that he led his own life, but also that contrasting against uh, the... Wall Street crash of the times when he got quite big and a lot of people were going through so much hardship and you even see in these days uh, people escape to the arts and theatre when the rest of life gets too hard to face and he captured something really fun and frivolous in that time and, and gave it to the people and they just were ready to take it on. <laughs> and how do you find his work as a performer? Um, it's really... Uh, just feels right to sing. Like uh, his phrasing is, is really quite elegant and, and sophisticated without ever being too much and you find with a lot of uh, modern composers is a, a bit of a tendency to over orchestrate because they have so many options and you can just double it on a computer and, <laughs> and things like that but yeah they're just very um, simple without needing to be you know over overly orchestrated or anything like that. Yeah. And what particular aspects of uh, Edward do you particularly like or particularly loathe when you when you play the show? Oh well, I think he can be a bit of a bit of spoiled brat here and there. He's quite e egotistical in the way that he sees his own his own path and his own role within Cole's life. Sometimes without seeing other people's, um, but I think he. He captures this youthful hope and optimism for something new and exciting. I mean, he speaks about music theatre being this up-and-coming creative outlet for, for composers and musicians and performers because up until people like Irving Berlin and, and Cole Porter furthered it, uh, the thought of a musical as a standalone piece to be able to tell a story wasn't really as, I think, as structured before that time, yeah. And is there any, without giving it away, is there any tension or play between Edward and Linda? Well, I think, uh, you know, any relationship where quite obviously and, and right in front of that person's face something else is going on with other people, there'd, there'd be some kind of tension against, uh, against the two of them or between the two of them, rather. Um, but, yeah, I guess, I guess, you know, under there it does happen. <laughs> And what's your, what's your favourite point or favourite song in the show? Uh, my favourite song... Um, I think it's one that I hadn't actually uh, known that well before we started working on it. Of course, I'd heard uh, it's called Begin the Begin. And I'd obviously heard it in the past, but I'd never performed it before. And it's a number that I get to sing. And it's just... It's one of the numbers that I said it just... The phrasing feels right. It's really beautiful to sing. It's really... Uh, What's the word? Just freeing, I guess, yep. yeah. <coughs> Do you find his work works, whether it's a uh, male or female vocalist? Because you seem to hit see both. Yeah, yeah, songs. definitely. Well, that's one thing. With a lot of older songs, they get taken out of their context. I mean, a lot of the, the shows that he wrote in his time uh, don't often get put up anymore. I mean, you, you see the classics like Anything Goes. I mean, that got a, a Broadway revival and is now coming out here in Australia next year. Um, but yeah, so a lot of people would take the songs out and they've, they've had the time to mature and be reorchestrated and changed into different keys for different artists and they can still shed a new light on, on that song even though they're getting on to almost 100 years old now, some of the songs, yeah. And did your perception of Cole Porter change before to now that you're engrossed in this show? Um, I think so. I think so. He was sort of, he's sort of, uh, having gone through a music theatre college and everything like that, he's a name that you hear a lot and is to a degree romanticised, but 
doing a bit more research on his life and times. I mean, there's still very much a romanticism about him because he lived in such, uh, you know, a different time and he lived such a life of luxury and, yeah, I mean, not without its hardships as well, but it's, it's sort of brought him down to earth, sort of someone that did have their own struggles. I mean, not only with, with something like sexuality, but also with, you know, he, has, he had this massive injury later on in life and, and it affected him for a long time. Yeah. And it seems like the, um, because he resisted for a long time after the injury, he wouldn't have his leg amputated. Yes, and yes. And then very late on, he had it off and Noel Coward said, this is it, he's, he's going to go up from here and going to improve. Yeah. It seems like that was actually the trigger for yeah. his demise. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting, actually, uh, without giving too much away, Linda references the point that she sees in Cole that it would be a break in his pride and that he wouldn't be able to put himself out there in front of people anymore. And, and I think that was a big thing for Cole. He was very, very proud of, of what he did, but also of the way that he lived his life and how he was able to live his life. And then once he was, I guess, to a degree in his own eyes deformed, he, he struggled to put himself in front of people or, or put his own work in front of others. Yeah. You mentioned that pride. There's, um, there's all the accounts of like him walking into the front row on opening night and taking his position and so thought, yeah, very mm. proud of his work and afterwards he essentially became a recluse. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting thing you see in, in show business when people are out there all the time, put in front of people and then suddenly when they don't have as much work going on or, or they're having their own personal issues, it's quite easy for them to become recluse and and I guess it's that thing as well, you know, do, do people love him for his work or did they love him for him? And I guess as, a, as an artist, that's something that people often struggle with. That would actually be a very interesting question, given the times and the lifestyle that he was le leading, mm. whether, whether it was the person or the music that had the, had the, had the appeal. Yeah, that's very true, actually. And, and I guess the person is shrouded by the romanticism of his work. And when you see you know, Cole Porter through his work, it, it is something spectacular and romanticised and everything like that. But if you were to meet a person, do they have the same energy as their work? I mean, I, you know, not fortunate enough to live in the same time to meet him, but I, I guess it can only be pondered upon, yeah. And you're obviously looking forward and very close to being ready for opening night? Yes, yes, not far away now. So uh, just rehearse, rehearse, rehearse and uh, go over things and, um, you know, clarify things, everything like that, all very exciting, but all in a day's work, really. <laughs> well, um, from the piece I saw before, it sounds like you're all very much on the right track, so thank you very much for thank your you. time. Thank <laughs> you. Cheers. Seeing the show. Thank you very much. So grand and the game, so So